All right, well, thanks everyone for coming. This is uh, great. I get a chance to talk about my little project, um, or the project that I contribute to, I should say. Uh, we actually had a presentation, I don't know, a few months back when we were doing everything remote. Alakos Fellini spoke about Bitcoin DevKit, um, and I'm going to be giving an update on the project. So um, we'll go from here. And at the end of this talk, I will put up a QR code if you want to get a link to the slides. So all, all of the links that I have in the slides, you'll be able to get to. How do I change? OK. Um, so first, I'm going to just talk a little bit about my open source Bitcoin journey. So I started um, as a typical enterprise software developer. I worked on financial software in the entertainment industry, primarily production accounting and residuals, super fascinating stuff. Um, but I was always interested in Bitcoin, and when I found out about Bitcoin, I sort of you know, fell down the rabbit hole like everybody else does. Um, I started working on a little solo project to make a wallet for mobile to do a multi-sig kind of escrow application. And actually, the first, uh, the first, uh, this is my second time or my third time speaking. But the first time I spoke in this group, I talked about my little solo project to make this wallet. Um, but while I was working on that wallet, I came to find that there weren't a lot of great Bitcoin libraries for making, um, for making mobile applications, or really for making applications in general. There's sort of a hodgepodge in different languages. Um, some work on mobile, some work on desktop, different languages, things like that. Um, so anyway, while I kind of ran into that issue, um, I found a project called Rust Bitcoin. So um, Rust is a programming language. And it's a really cool programming language. There's a library called Rust Bitcoin, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but basically, I thought, OK, Rust Bitcoin provides a lot of great tools, a lot of great pieces, but it doesn't actually provide a full like, development kit for making a wallet. So I started thinking and working in that area. Um, while I was doing that, I ran into Alakos Fellini, who um, was working on basically the same idea and made incredible progress on it. So we teamed up, and his project was originally called Magical Bitcoin. We teamed up and we renamed it to Bitcoin DevKit, just to make it a little more explicit about what it does. Um, but he already had basically everything I wanted right there. So we started, started with what he had and started building on that to make it, um, to make it, you know, to basically build a community around it, to build all the tools, to build documentation, a website, um, and then start working on more mobile support. Um, whoops, I switched slides. So then Alakos and I teamed up, and um, we pitched the idea to uh, Square Crypto, which is now called Spiral. I've got it on my shirt. <laughs> they sent me a sweater. Um, and I got a grant to basically work full time on BDK um, with the other BDK developers and to contribute to that project and to basically build it into a project that would make creating Bitcoin wallets on any platform at least 10 times easier than it currently was. So that was like our mission, is to make, to make it easy. And this isn't, I should have mentioned, it's a completely open source. So the Bitcoin DevKit library is licensed Apache and MIT, which is basically the broadest way you can license open source software. And the goal is to make it so that any open source project doesn't need to reinvent the wheel. They can pick this library, start building their application, and know that it's already got a community of developers that are you know, supporting it, testing it, um, building documentation, and will support them in whatever project they're doing, whether it's a closed source project or an open source project, which is important. All right, so this is a little map of the ecosystem in which Bitcoin DevKit lives. So I mentioned Rust Bitcoin. Rust Bitcoin is there on the left side. And what's interesting about it is it's just the primitives that you need to build Bitcoin applications. So it's like, what is a transaction? What is a block? You know, how do signatures work? Um, that's like Rust Bitcoin's core. Um, these lines represent what depends on what. So you can see that this, this Bitcoin library depends on hashes, Betch32, and um, SecP256K. So those are basically all the primitives you need to build Bitcoin applications. And, um, and then there's another one here called Consensus. What's interesting about Consensus and Sec256K1 those actually wrap the original core library code. So they take the C code, and they basically put a wrapper around it to make it easy to use in applications, um, and then present it through. Um, and then another one here, this Miniscript. Miniscript we'll talk about in a minute, but it's basically a way of representing Bitcoin scripts in a way that can be easily audited, easily tested, 
and validated for correctness. And it also just makes writing Bitcoin scripts much, much easier, especially complex Bitcoin scripts. Um, so anyway, so that all existed before BDK. What BDK added to it, and I'll go into more detail later about the specific features, but basically Bitcoin relies on all of these existing Rust Bitcoin libraries. Um, and then we added, like I said, stuff around it. So we added basically a wallet, um, all the things you need to build a wallet, to build transactions, um, to get blocks from the blockchain. And there's various ways to get blocks from the blockchain. And we added this thing called BDK CLI. BDK CLI is just a simple tool that you can use. And basically every feature that we have present in the library, you can access through the CLI. So if you're testing or you just want to learn about it or play with it, we have different blog posts where we use the CLI to just demonstrate how to use a feature. Or if you're writing an application and you want to see how to use a feature in code, you can look at our examples or you can look at it in the CLI and see how we kind of access those features. Um, and then there's another, one of the other kind of top level projects in BDK is this Electrum client. So when you make a wallet or any Bitcoin application, you need to somehow get data from the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, you can, and there's multiple kind of ways you can do that. One is called, a very common one is called the Electrum protocol. And Electrum is basically a server that sits in front of your Bitcoin full node. It indexes all of the data in the Bitcoin blockchain and you can ask it questions. You can say, give me a transaction, give me the, the top block, give me the current fee rate, things like that. Um, so we support that. Um, and there's a whole crate around how to do that. Crates is what Rust calls packages. Um, and then, so that's like the core Rust version of BDK. Then on top of that is another project called BDK FFI. FFI means it's a sort of a, a wonky name for it means foreign function interface, and it comes from the C world, and it's how programs interact, kind of a low level. Anyway, f we needed this FFI layer. What that allows us to do is build different languages on top of the Rust core library. So. Say you're not a Rust developer, but you're a Java developer or a Kotlin developer. Or maybe you're writing something on Swift for iOS. Basically, this FFI allows us to express all of the functionality of BDK in those other languages so that it looks just like those languages to you. And we can recompile the library to be native and run, not interpreted or anything like that. It's basically running as native code on your mobile platform or on your Mac in Swift, and you can use all the Swift UI, and that's the most common reason for mobile devices is somebody wants to use like you know the native UI stuff. Um, so anyway, right now for foreign languages, we're supporting, um, like I said, Kotlin, which also works for Java, Swift, and Python, which is a bit new, but Python is just a fun language to play with. It's great for learning. Um, so anyway, so those are sort of the two big pieces of BDK. It's the stuff we rely on with Rust Bitcoin, and then the stuff we built on top of that. Okay, so this is sort of a laundry list of all of the features that BDK provides. I won't go, I'll just sort of hit the highlights of it, um, but just to kind of give you a sort of tour of what it can do. And this is really useful if you're thinking about building a Bitcoin application. And it's, you know, we, we call our kind of main structure a wallet. You know, so you have a Bitcoin wallet, you can check a balance, things like that. But really, anything you do with Bitcoin is going to need that kind of wallet functionality. So you could be making, I don't know, an exchange, or you could be making you know, anything else that uses Bitcoin, and you're going to need these features. So the first thing, and this is probably the, the biggest differ differentiator initially with BDK from other libraries, was it uses something called descriptors. So um, I mentioned Miniscript. Descriptors are also a way to to represent the conditions under which you can spend Bitcoin. So if you wanna, you know, if you wanna say like the very simplest kind of script is you could say, if, if uh, you know, I'm gonna write a script and that script says that this is a public key and if you have the private key for this public key, you can spend the Bitcoin. Like that's kind of the simplest possible script. Um, but there's a whole lot more complicated scripts you can do. You can say if you have, um, you know, two of three, so if you have Two private keys out of three public private key, or two private keys out of three, and you sign with two of those, then you can spend a Bitcoin, and then you can add onto that something like a time lock. This is one of the things that Lightning does: is they say if you have the signature plus a time lock or plus a secret, so a, H, uh, a hash, time uh, the pre-image to a hash, 
So it's like a secret. So now you can say you could have certain combinations of signatures, plus maybe a time lock, so it has to be after a certain block, plus it could be you have this also the secret. And you can put those together in various combinations to make very interesting applications. Um, and descriptors plus mini script make that all very user accessible. They do it in a very, it, two things they do. It makes it easier, more auditable, easier to kind of make sure it's correct. And the library, like I said, it's trying to make it easier for you. So it actually, by using these features, it, it'll, you know, the library makes sure it's correct. It will give you an error if you make a script that can't be spent from, for instance, or is invalid against the, the rules of Bitcoin. So you don't have to get into all that unless you really want to. Um, uh, but what was I saying? So then, um, yeah, so now you can make a wallet that has those spending conditions built in via descriptors and via miniscript. Um, the other thing it does, which is a standard feature today in wallets, is something called hierarchical deterministic keys. So that means instead of just having some random key you generated with your hardware wallet, you can actually have a, a, a key path and generate from your seed words. So say you have your 12 or your 24 seed words, you can generate an unlimited almost amount of new keys. And you can actually embed those into these descriptor scripts. So you could have a, a wallet based on a descriptor. And if anybody's familiar with a service like I don't know, like Unchained Capital or something like that, where you have a, a shared multi-sig wallet. If you ever like, if you ever told it to export that wallet in a way that's cross-platform, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get the descriptor and you're going to get your keys. So, um, so anyway, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin DevKit allows you to do that in a standard way. So it's not just like, we didn't make any of this stuff up. This is just taking these best practices, taking these standards, these BIPs from Bitcoin, and giving you the tools to use them without you having to invent them. Um, some of the other things, um, so we have a, most people will probably use something like a hardware wallet, but we also do have code, and this comes in really handy for testing, that you can make your own seeds. So we have a little library for making a Bitcoin seed and then deriving keys from that seed. Um, uh, we don't currently support receiving for a taproot address, um, although that is in the works right now. Um, we do allow sending to Taproot, so we've kind of got that first step. Um, we hope soon to have the actually being full, ta you know, having all of these descriptor features and all of these, the whole, the whole wallet support also for Taproot. That's currently like a, a goal for this year. Um, so now you have a wallet, you have this, this descriptor that describes the spending conditions for that wallet. Now you need to to save some data, like so, when you're like downloading blocks and downloading transactions, um, you need to down, you know, you need to save it. You could download it every time, but it wouldn't be efficient. So we also support what are called pluggable databases. So you can either use um, something called Sled, which is a key values, very simple database. We also support SQLite, which is very common on mobile, um, and then we have just an in-memory one, which is great for testing. Um, and then a, another standard, like I'm throwing out lots of standards here, but the other one that we support is PSBT. So it's called, it's a partially signed Bitcoin transaction. That's sort of the typical interface between a software wallet and a hardware wallet, or one software wallet and another software wallet. So if we were in one of these multi-sig contracts and you had a key and I had a key and I would create a transaction to spend out of that, call it a vault, I would sign it, I would then create a PSBT out of it, I would send it to you. You would then put it in your hardware device or put it in your software. Then you could sign it. And then once you've signed it, if, assuming that was a sufficient number of signatures, you could then put it on the blockchain yourself. So everything within BDK is based on PSBTs. Um, so that's another like best practice. We help enforce. We help make it easy to use. Um, the other great thing about PSBTs is you can um, convert them to just a text string. So you can put them in a text message. You know, that's a kind of like very... You know, it's meant for passing around. Um, and, um, and then you've got all your normal wallet features. So you can get the balance of your wallet. You can get the transactions. You can get the unspent UTXOs, which is an unspent um, output, transaction output. Um, so all the standard things. And then the final thing is you need to sync your wallet to the blockchain. So you have, you know, you have a, a wallet definition which defines all your keys. You need to go see if there's been any activities on those keys. That's what syncing means. Um, so yeah, so that's like all of our, what I'm calling our basic feature set. 
And the reason we sep the reason for this presentation I separated it was because um, these are all the features we support everywhere. So they're supported in the Rust library, they're supported on Kotlin, Swift, Python. You can just run it on your Linux machine, your Mac, um, your Android device, or your iOS device. Like this is kind of the, the core set of functionality we support everywhere. Um, and we have various projects I'll talk about that are already using the library in those ways. Um, so the next slide is what I'm calling the more advanced features. So these features are only supported currently under Rust. Um, one of the goals for this year is to support all the features on every platform. Um, but Rust is always going to be the first class language for this library. It, it provides a lot of functionality as a development tool. Um, but we will, you know, the, we do want to support as much as we possibly can in every language. Um, but currently, these are the features that are only in Rust. Um, one of them is templates. So say you're making a descriptor and you want to make sure, so like I said, you can make all sorts of crazy signing conditions in, um, in a descriptor. But say you just want to use a standard one. Like say you are going to be talking to somebody, you're going to be talking to another wallet that uses some standard descriptor construction. Um, and they have these things, BIP44, BIP49, BIP84. And those represent different ways of defining a, a standard wallet. We have templates, so you can just use one of our templates, plug in your key, and you know that you're going to be compliant with those standards. Um, we also have additional blockchain clients. So I forgot to mention before that in the sort of basic feature set, we support Electrum and we support Esplora. So those are sort of two um, indexing servers that sit in front of a full node. In the more advanced feature set, we also support a um, sort of a basic version of comp what's called compact block filters. So that's um, BIP157, 158. It's a way of talking directly to a Bitcoin node. Um, uh, they sometimes call it, uh, I forgot the name, but anyway, what's that? Bloom filters. Uh, they aren't Bloom filters, actually. They're, um, BIP they're, they're compact block filters. So they're, um, they're not the original light client standard. They're... Um, uh, this was Lightning Labs, sort of, uh, Lalu sort of was one of the guys pioneering this concept. But anyway, we only support connecting to a single Bitcoin node for compact block filters. Um, in the future, we might, you know, we hope to expand it to support every, to support connecting to multiple nodes. And the reason you would want to connect to multiple nodes is you might want to compare the data from one node with the data you get from another node to make sure one of them isn't giving you false data. Currently, though, we only support connecting to a single node, so you should use compact block filters only to connect to a node that you either know, run, or trust. Um, and my screen keeps disappearing. The other thing we support is, um, in, the only, in the more advanced feature set is what's called uh, pr pluggable coin selection. So coin selection is, uh, again, sort of a esoteric topic, but it does apply to anybody making a Bitcoin wallet. And coin selection means is you want to find, you want to, when, you, when you're spending money out of your wallet, you want to put together the UTXOs, so your unspent pieces of Bitcoin, you want to put them together in such a way that you do it in, quote unquote, the most efficient way. And the most efficient way is potentially different for different people, but you, you generally want to make sure that the cost of putting it on the blockchain is low, as well as the cost in the future to spend those Bitcoin is reasonably low. So you're sort of balancing out the current, the current fees and the future fees. Um, anyway, so there's various ways to do that. So that's why we make it a pluggable feature. So you'd either use one of the coin selection algorithms we provide. Um, branch and bound is a very popular one, um, and it's the default one in BDK. Or we also support what's called largest first. Largest first, first is more for testing. It's probably not a particularly efficient one. Um, but it's an example of that we can have more than one. Um, somebody right now is working on another coin selection alg algorithm called oldest first. Um, and in the Socratic part, we'll talk about that one some more. Um, and then, so those are pluggable coin selectors. Um, the other thing we support are pluggable signers. So that means, so you could either, you could either just give the wallet your private key, like have the wallet store your, you know, in your whatever application you're building, just have it in your software. Or you might want to talk to some hardware wallet, hardware device. In that case, you might want to write a custom bit of code to connect to whatever it is that's holding your private keys. So we call that a signer, um, and it can be anything. Um, the other features that we support in the more advanced feature set is 
um, creating a bump fee transaction. So that might be, you can, you can actually mark a transaction when you put it on the blockchain as potentially changeable. So you could start with a low fee, put a low fee transaction on the blockchain. If for some reason it doesn't get confirmed and you need it to get confirmed, you can now actually change that transaction as long as the output stay the same and give it a higher fee so that it gets confirmed sooner. So it's a nice, it's a nice way of balancing out and not overspending on fees, which maybe isn't an issue today, but will potentially be an issue in the future. Um, so uh, you can also, you know, like I said, we can have these complex spending conditions. We provide in the, in the, in the Rust library a way to view these spending conditions. So it's going to kind of output it as a structure you can show to the user and say, okay, you need, you know, Alice, Bob, or Alice, Bob, and Carol to sign it under different scenarios, something like that. Um, uh, the other thing we have op returns. So say you just want to put some random text on the internet, uh, random text in the blockchain for some protocol. Maybe you're building on top of Bitcoin. Um, we allow you to do that. You can just make a transaction, give it this text. It'll put it in op return. Add that to your script uh, or to your transaction. Um, uh, and then the last two are a little more probably not as used as often, but they're kind of interesting. You can compile what's called a mini script. Um, spending policies. So there's a way sort of, it's still not English language at all, but it's a more human readable version of a way to describe how to spend these Bitcoin. And then you can compile it into Miniscript, which is a standard sort of forward and backward compatible with Bitcoin script um, language. Um, so we, we have a, a way you can do those in, this, in the library uh, or access those features. Um, and then the, the last one is you can verify if you get a transaction from, say, you're connected to um, Blockstream and you're getting uh, you're getting transaction histories from them. You might want to validate those transactions against the Bitcoin consensus rules. Um, like you may not fully trust them, or you just want to maybe in your application you're getting a transaction from some random person you're interacting with, and you want to make sure they gave you a transaction that meets all of the consensus rules that Bitcoin Core enforces. Um, that's part of Bitcoin, Rust Bitcoin, and we expose that in a way that you can use it in your application to, to check that. So you can, you know, it's literally running the same code that a Bitcoin D node would run, but it's running it in your mobile application or your desktop application. So it's pretty cool. And, and you can turn that on by default or you can make it optional. It does maybe slow things down a small, small amount, but that's it. Okay, so, so that's all the stuff BDK is doing today. Um, and I should mention, so I'm a contributor on the Bitcoin Dev Kit project, which means you know, me and a group of other people are all spending our time um, writing open source changes to the software, writing documentation, testing the software, reviewing other people's contributions, um, talking at things like this. So we're all contributing in different ways. Um, one of the challenges I found coming from a closed source world to an open source world is when you're working on open source stuff, you sort of have to make your own agenda up. You know, you don't have a, a product manager or a business unit saying, okay, this is what you're going to get done this quarter. Work overtime, get it done. You've got to decide what your priorities are for the project. And, you know, of course, you're talking to people using the library and you're talking to, you know, your other contributors. But, you, you, you know, there's a lot of latitude there. So, so actually, so this is what I am focusing on this year. Um, as I said, I started with mobile, and that's my focus for this year. Like it's been my focus since I began was trying to build up the support for running BDK and providing good support for BDK on mobile. So that's one of the areas where I'm going to be spending my time as coding and also reviewing stuff. Um, so adding all of these advanced features I mentioned that aren't yet available in mobile, providing them in mobile, um, making sure that we have good release packages. So we're you know we're for um, Android and also for iOS as sort of ways to package the code that makes it easier for somebody that's using like Xcode or Android Studio to just pull your software in. So providing those releases for people to just easily pull in and get the latest and greatest stuff. Um, and then something we need a lot of work on is documentation. Like we've got all this code, but no one's going to use it unless there's good documentation. So spending more time on that is a, some, one of my priorities and examples. Um, 
The other one is there's an effort going on right now in BDK. So currently we're considered sort of in beta, like we don't have a what's called a stable API, so we're still making changes as we add stuff. Um, there's an effort going on right now. Um, some of the folks in um, that are happen to be in Australia are working on this, but I it's one of my focuses to help in any way I can to stabilize our API. And the idea there is we want a stable API, so if any any project, commercial or open source, want to adopt BDK, they can be pretty sure that the API is set. Like they don't, they're not going to have to rewrite their software because we're making some major change. So that's like a focus for this year for the whole BDK team, I think, is to sort of stabilize our API and be able to sort of announce that we're ready for, like we're open for business if you want to actually deliver a commercial app or a production ready app. Production ready meaning, again, it's still open source, so anybody using the software should do their own audits, do their own testing, but we feel it's in a good, a good spot. Um, the other one is full taproot support. So I'll, I have a link later. Alicos has been working on taproot support, so I want to support that effort. And you know, as, you know, there's a lot of testing that's going to be needed there to support taproot. And that means you could actually, from a BDK wallet, generate a taproot address and have somebody send you Bitcoin on chain with taproot. And taproot, I think we've talked about it in this group before, has a lot of privacy benefits, a lot of efficiency benefits, so your transactions are much smaller or can be much smaller for some of these complicated scenarios. Um, so Taproot is a big, a big priority for the whole project also. Um, the other one is, some of you have probably heard of LDK, which is Lightning Dev Kit. Um, we were inspired, when, when, I, when we created this project, part of the inspiration, we, we named it BDK because you know, LDK had already been created and we wanted to do the same thing that LDK was doing, but for on-chain transactions. Um, and may, you know, as LDK is making Lightning transactions easier, we want to make on-chain transactions easier. So we're working, there's a, a person named John Cantrell, 97, who's been working on integrating BDK and LDK. So that's getting that stuff shipped and ready to go and, and in people's hands where they can integrate. They can basically have a wallet on mobile or desktop or server that supports both Lightning and supports on-chain, tightly integrated together in a way that is easy to use. Um, and the other one is doing things like this, like onboarding new developers, telling people about the project. That's one of my, you know, it's, it's, it's easy as a developer to just sit there and write code, but it really, the code is only as good as the people that are using it. So if, if, if you're not talking to people and finding out what they need, or just telling them about it that it even exists, there's no really point in working on this stuff. So my priority, you know, one of hers this year is um, go to conferences, go to meetups, and also we're working, I'm working this summer, a bunch of us on BDK are working on something called Summer of Bitcoin, where there's a bunch of university students from all over the country, or all over the world actually, um, that can basically get a summer internship and get paid to work on open source contributions. A lot of the program is to just, um, learn about how to contribute to open source projects, but along the way they will also be helping open source projects like BDK, so it's a bit of a, a mentoring sort of thing and also they're making contributions. So I, I encourage you all, if you're interested in, if you know any students, go have them check out Summer Bitcoin. It's a really cool program. Um, and then the final thing that is on my uh, priority list is, so we started as a small team. We were funded in various different ways, um, but the team has been growing and um, we've, we've gotten some very generous initial funding from our sponsors, but if we're gonna grow the project, we need to grow our funding also. So I'm working, talking to people, figuring out how we can grow the, the sources of funding for the project. Um, I wanna make sure that developers working and contributing to the project can get funded directly. If they have a Bitcoin wallet, they should be able to fund it directly. Um, via some, there's a lot of, or there's a few Bitcoin nonprofits that have recently come into existence and we want to tap into that as a resource. Um, we're going to get commercial users ideally and would like them to be able to contribute back either with their own developers or with money for the developers we have. Um, and, and also right now, it's a little hard to be a part-time developer and get funding just in general, not just on BDK. So I, you know, we have a lot of developers who want to contribute but they don't want to quit their day jobs. I mean, it's a, it's a very big commitment um, and just to be able to support those part-time developers that are just dipping their toe into open source, want to be able to support them. So that's what I'm focused on this year. 
Um, so the, the final, uh, the next slide here. So this is, like I said, I'll give a link for all these. These are a bunch of really interesting projects that are related to BDK that I just wanted to call out. Uh, the first one, like I mentioned, was Lightning Dev Kit. Everybody should check that out. Very interesting. Um, I put a link to Alakos wrote a blog post where he demonstrated with a forked version of BDK how he was able to um, send and receive Taproot transactions. And he, I don't know if anybody saw this on Twitter, but he was one of the first or second Taproot transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain, and he did it with BDK. He did it using a forked version, but only because some of the libraries we needed needed some little changes. So he actually even has an awk return, which is a text string in his transaction that you can go back and look at. It's in his blog post where you can see, you know, created with BDK. So I thought it was super, super cool. Um, anybody interested in Taproot and BDK should check that out. Um, the other person is Lloyd um, Fournier. I don't know if I said his name right. He's, he's, he, he's a big contributor also, and he's um, working on something called Gun Wallet, which is um, Go Up Number Wallet. That name might change. Um, but it's, it, he's, he's got a system using BDK where it's sort of, it's experimenting with smart contracts sort of stuff, or I'm sorry, not smart contracts. It's exploring the idea of, um, uh, what do I call it? A, um, it's, it's basically a little betting command line app, but it uses a Oracle to complete the contract. Um, so you can do basically a bet on a coin flip, and then there'll be an Oracle that will post, post a secret or post a, a, a pre-image that you can use to see who won the, the bet. Super interesting stuff. He's doing a lot of other stuff, but I just thought I'd call out that project. Um, the other person I mentioned was John Cantrell. He's working on a project called Sensei, which is a integrated BDK, LDK wallet set of libraries and tools. Um, um, so that's, that's very new stuff, but really cool to check out. Um, Thunder Biscuit is another longtime contributor on BDK. Uh, he's been doing a lot of stuff around like educating people about BDK and working on the language binding parts like Kotlin. So he has a wallet, which especially for anybody learning about Bitcoin is interesting. It's called Padawan. And it's, so if anybody's familiar with Bitcoin, there's testnet and real Bitcoin. So he's got a wallet that is on testnet and you can basically put it on your Android phone, get some testnet Bitcoin immediately send it somewhere and do all the things you would do on a Bitcoin wallet, but without having to buy any Bitcoin. So really interesting. Um, another person that's been a, a using BDK in a really interesting way is um, Richard Ulrich. Um, and he works for a bank. And the, five minutes, okay. Um, he, uh, he works for a bank and the bank custody, custodies cryptocurrency, including Bitcoin, and they wanted to use BDK as a way of doing a proof of reserve. So that's basically looking at the balance of their Bitcoin vault, creating a signed message that you can use or an auditor can use to verify when that um, message was created that a certain number of Bitcoin existed in that vault. So proof of reserves, very interesting. He's been using BDK for that project. Um, the other person is Raj, and he's... He's got another, he's been working on BDK, doing a lot of cool stuff with the CLI and um, generally around the project, but he's also got a particular interest in something called Noster, which is a kind of messaging thing like Twitter. And he's trying to make a version of it that uses BDK to handle some of the, you know, I get various, various issues you get with messaging and Twitter type applications, but using Bitcoin and BDK. Um, and then Ricardo Casata, was a, uh, another grantee on BDK. He created, they're not specific to BDK, but we use them a lot in BDK. This thing called Bitcoin D and Elect RSD. These are Rust libraries that make testing really easy. So if you're making a wallet and you wanna test it, you kinda wanna test it with a fully running Bitcoin node or a fully running Electrum node. But how do you create automated tests to do that? He created these tools that basically download and then store on disk the original daemons, Bitcoin daemon, ElectorS daemon, and then start them up, set them up with some test Bitcoin, and then you can do various operations, run your test, and then they shut down automatically. And you can do all your tests in parallel. It's, it's a little geeky, but it's amazing stuff. Really makes testing, if you're working on a Bitcoin wallet project, much easier. Um, 
Another person is Igor Kota. Um, he's working with a company called Foundation Devices, and they are also using BDK on their project. I'm not exactly sure how they're using it. They have not, I don't think they've necessarily announced it. They've announced that they're working, they're using BDK somehow, but I'm not exactly sure all the details of it, but interesting that they're using it, and I think it's probably more for the mobile aspect, which is really cool. Um, the other person I want to mention was Luca Vaccaro. He's, um, he works for Blockstream, and he created something called BTC Tip Server. So it's basically a little server anybody could spin up, and it just gives you new Bitcoin addresses. So it's very simple, very lightweight. You can give it a read-only wallet, so you don't have to give it any private keys. Run it out on the cloud or run it on your little home box, and then it pops up a web page. You can, you can put that behind Tor and just you know, get new addresses, perfect for donations. Um, it doesn't get a lot of attention, but I think it's a super great use for BDK. Um, and then I'll just mention Vishal, and he's working on a, a, wa a wallet project specifically for India. Um, and then there's this new wallet that just recently kind of started tweeting stuff called Lava Wallet. They're also using BDK. So interesting projects. Right. So I just wanted to thank the sponsors. Um, these companies have been very generous in supporting the open source devs working on this. Um, you know, they, they you know, took, a, took a risk on a project that was very new and have been just kind of supportive the whole way in making this, a, helping us grow the project. Um, the next one, so this is a QR code. If anybody wants a link to these slides, you can just scan this QR code. Um, this is a link to the uh, Mastodon, Twitter, GitHub and Discord and our webpage. The webpage has our documentation on it. And um, that's all our, that's the, the best way to reach the team live is on Discord. We post all the announcements about new releases, new developments on Twitter and Discord. And um, yeah, like I said, the website has all the other information. So thank you all. And I hope uh, anyone interested in building a, any kind of application using Bitcoin will check out BDK. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't do QA. Um, uh, just, yeah. You mentioned key bumping. Yeah. Uh, is that CPFTN full area? It's um well CHA pays for uh, so it's it's fee bumping, it's RBF, so oh, yeah. it's RBF. But I think to do child pays for parent, I think you just need to create a transaction and we do a lot, I mean you could create a transaction. So I think the only the only feature you need to do child pays for parent is you need to re reuse an already spent output right. in a new transaction, we do support that. Okay. Yeah, so we do support that. Yeah, that was actually a feature that just got added in our last release because somebody else requested it. <laughs> a good question. Uh, any other questions? I, I should have asked. From a, so from a feature set perspective, you mentioned popping. Uh -huh. um, those, I'm assuming those are the SDKs that are available. Yep. Available so like that. It's a SDK for the BDK? Yes. Okay. Well, it's a, it's a, like, so for Kotlin, we're on Maven Central. You just add us as a, as a dependency on your project, and you'll get a AAR file for Android, or you'll get a, J, a JAR file for a desktop app. Okay, and then, so is multi-sig a, a feature yes. that is provided? Yeah, so multi-sig is, is in the basic feature set. You just have to have a multi-sig descriptor. You just have to use one of, you know, just use that format. And yeah, okay. not just multi-sig, but all the other features having to do with hashes and things too. Yeah. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, have you checked out uh, Coinbase's Coinbase Wallet's SDK that they rolled out? No, nope, haven't haven't checked that out. Although I assume it's primarily server based. <laughs> we hate Coinbase. No, <laughs> uh, another question? Yes. Hi. 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 Um, sure. How do we access the library, or is it all support for programming? Well, so if you are a Rust developer, you can just use the Rust library. It's on crates.io. Um, or you can build it yourself, and it's all open source, so you can build it yourself by going to our GitHub link. Um, if you want to use the use it in Java, Kotlin, Swift, Python, um, for um, Kotlin and for Swift, there we create packages. You can just link to those packages in your dependency for your project. Um, for Python, it's also on PyPy, I think it's called. I'm not a, super familiar with the name of their stuff, but I think it's PyPy. We 
we provide a package there too. So, yeah. However, whatever tools you're using, it will it will work with. Yep. Yes. Uh, the, the database support is more for caching and, yeah. and migration through storage. Yeah. So it basically caches anything you download from your blockchain. It doesn't keep the keys in the database, just the the, the blockchain data. So that's what the database is used and for. Do you have migration scripts for the updates? We do. Okay. Well, the only, so the, uh, in the key value database, you don't really do a migration. Okay. Well, I, actually, so the key value database, it just sort of ignores the old versions of stuff. Um, although we do have a summer of Bitcoin student who's going to work on making a, a nicer migration script for the key value database. But for SQLite, we do a full migration. So we'll actually update the schema. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, great question. So yeah, anybody who's not a developer who's just interested in helping us with docs or helping just you know look at our examples and see if they make sense, um, yeah, we're always looking for help in that area. I, I was speaking to somebody at one of the other meetups that um, we got a request from um, Andreas Antonopoulos to add a chapter to his book, like his appendix. He has an appendix of different Bitcoin tools. He wanted somebody to help write a just an example of using BDK CLI. So anybody wants to help with that, that'd be great. Yeah, good question. Anything else? Thanks, Steve. All right, thanks. We're going to Socratic. <laughs>